Good morning. Welcome to the quarantine edition of our Sunday morning Sunday school class in 2 Corinthians. Just will open in a word of prayer. Father God, we're thankful for this time we have together. We pray, Lord, that um, you would just right now, to whoever is watching or listening to this, that you your peace would be with them, God, that through uh, the difficulty where we experience or the discomfort, we know that you are our source and that you are the uh, you're the one who gives us the peace that passes understanding, and we ask for your blessing and your keeping in your name. Amen. So today we're going to talk, uh, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll talk a little bit about verses 7 through 15. Um, trying to kind of break this up into manageable chunks, because uh, it's a lot of stuff crammed into the fourth chapter. Um, well, starting at... Um, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It said, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. And we're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sake, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. It's kind of a lot in there. It's kind of interesting, Paul, in verses 7 through 15, he kind of uses a uh, Pottery is an analogy to the minister, uh, as an analogy to the to the minister of the gospel, and we've all heard the saying that you can't judge a book by its cover. I would say, I would submit to you that that's true of ministers or missionaries of the gospel. Um, on the surface, they may not look mu like much. They actually may not be in a style or or something that or a way that we identify or, or expect them to be. But true missionaries and ministers of the gospel carry a message of salvation that's worth more than any jewels or precious metal. Um, they may truly appear like a clay pot, but the treasure that they carry inside is invaluable. Uh, in Matthew 13, uh, chapter 13, verses 44 through 46, we see two brief parables that kind of teach us about the treasure, uh, the hidden treasure, um, which is what's being relayed in the kingdom of heaven. And we see in the, in the, the first parable, it, it talks about a man who found a treasure hidden in a field. And when he found it, he hid it. And then he went away, sold all that he had so that he could purchase that field with the treasure in it. And then right next to it, the next uh, verse, and the parable, it's the par parable of the pearl of great price, where we are told the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found the pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. And it isn't it interesting that uh, selling all that you have to get something better there might be a message in there for us uh, as Christians. Maybe surrendering uh, ourselves to God is is a very uh, minute price compared to what we get in return. So right there we see a picture of the value of the gospel message, the fact that Jesus Christ was sent by his Father to, to, to live on the earth and to die on the cross and, to, and three days to rise again so that we could be uh, reconciled with the Father. And that's kind of a theme that we've seen running through this class in, in of Corinthians. And indeed, it's a theme through the whole New Testament. Um, and we also see what, what can be considered a paradox. where We have an amazing uh, treasure that's in a common clay pot. 
Um, one can take a look at Paul and, and understand that maybe why he used the analogy of a common clay pot. Uh, Paul uh, was thought to have many faults. There was obviously some contemporaries of him who didn't think much of him the way he, he preached or the way he taught. But he, and we talked about this before in previous chapters, but he, he stayed true to a message. Paul's treasure, Paul's value was was the treasure that he kept in his heart and relayed to the people of Corinth and the Ephesians and the church and, and church of Rome. It was the, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. So the treasure of the whole gospel message about Jesus um, is, is really what the treasure that Paul, the clay pot, contained. So what, why would you, why would Paul use this? Why would he use this uh, this example, the use of pottery? He says, well, everyone he he, he uh, was communicating with uh, in his day would understand that analogy. Every archaeological dig in the Middle East yields pottery. Uh, I have a habit of watching the History Channel a lot, sometimes much to other my other family members' dismay. But every time they do an archaeological show about the Middle East, it, it, the discussion eventually goes to shards of pottery. It's just, it's euphemistic. It's always there. Well, the other aspect of it is that while the well-to-do or rich people, they used to, to make vessels out of different things. They would uh, turn materials like ivory or glass or, or marble or brass, uh, metal alloys, and create pottery. Uh, to, to create vessels that they would store things in. But pottery was really the vessels of the common people. Um, clay pots were really useful. Uh, items of great value could be stored in them. They were great for storing liquids because there's something about the nature of the clay pottery that, that would prevent evaporation and keep contents cool. And in a hot environment, I would think that that would be important. So they were uh, very useful, useful vessels. Um, and at the time, it's kind of interesting, and this is something I did get from the History Channel, so just forgive me there, is that pottery, even when it was broken, uh, they used the shards for, for things. Uh, even though the, the initial use of the pot was no longer uh, a viable thing, they would use the shards of pottery for things like receipts. They'd write notes to each other. And uh, for, for for messages, so that even those shards, even even the leftover refuse of the broken pot, was valuable, or served a purpose. And then you know one of the most significant things you know, and for us on this side of history, we remember reading about uh, or hearing about the Dead Sea Scrolls. It was a it was a shepherd um, or a from a local tribe, he'd thrown a rock into a cave near Qumran and heard breaking pottery. And it was that pottery that he that they found that contained um, the Dead Sea Scrolls. You know, just invaluable archaeological find that gave us some insight of what was happening in Bible times, but also contained uh, fragments or, or parts of books of the Old Testament. So very, very valuable uh, historical find. But to further... Uh, develop this comparison between the minister or the missionary and the common clay pot, we see Paul using another uh, literary form called cataloging of deeds. And we would look at this and it's like a curriculum vitae or uh, resume. It's a lot, we would, something that highlights our, our accomplishments or a kind of resume. So Paul, he goes through four things here. And this is a, maybe it's timely. Maybe these things are, are timely for where we're at in our world right now and the things that we're experiencing. Paul highlights four things. And he uses throughout this, in, the, in these verses, um, starting in verse um, verse 8, but he, he kind of, he has an emphasis. He says these things and what he, there's an emphasis on, he says, on every side, which we see in verse 8, and always in verse 10 and 11, emphasize the extent 
and the intensity of these things that he was dealing with. So first of all, we see in, in verse 8, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. The, the word for hard-pressed really means to press in hard against or someone or something, as we may say today, squeezing the life out of somebody. The term not crushed kind of indicates that the pressure never got to a point where there was no way that he could escape. Again, the picture of the grace of God kind of keeping him, uh, Paul being within God's will and God taking care of him. Uh, in the next verse, or, uh, he's, he talks about um, we're perplexed but not in despair. The original language indicate that Paul was saying that he was at a loss at how to proceed sometimes, but he wasn't to the point, as we might say now, that he was going off the deep end or that he was actually in despair. And then he goes on and says that, that we're persecuted yet not abandoned. The Greek word for persecuted means to pursue. And it's often the same sense that we would see it um, and I'm not a language scholar, so I had to do some digging on this. It's often used in the sense of tracking prey or what we would just say today, hunting, um, which kind of fit because he, Paul was, it's noted, um, was pursued from city to city, oftentimes by angry, hostile Jews who saw him as somewhat of a traitor. But through it all, um, God never abandoned Paul. The idea is that God never left Paul in a position where... Uh, he wouldn't experience God's protection. And then lastly, he says, and um, actually, and this is verse, in verse 9 as well, he says, he is struck down by the enemy, but not destroyed. He was not only pursued by the hostile, some hostile Jews. Um, when they caught up with him, they stirred up all the trouble that they could. And and so he may be, there's a couple of things he may be referring to here. Um, he was uh, stoned, which I would consider that trouble. Uh, he was stoned outside of the city of Lister, and he was left for dead outside the city, but he obviously lived. So he summed up his experiences in, in verse 10 by bringing the focus back to where he often brought the focus back, and that is to Jesus Christ, where he said, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Paul felt, and we again we've talked about this if you have been in the class, Paul felt a kind of kinship <coughs> with, uh, with Jesus because many people wanted Paul dead in the same way that people wanted Jesus dead. Paul endured constant threats. He was arrested many times. He was beaten a few times that we know of. And he would eventually, he would be martyred in Rome uh, in July of probably the year 64, probably in July. And um, just as a side note, there's some interesting things I, I don't want to get into here. But if it's a thing, of, uh, point of interest for you, there, there's some interesting accounts of, of, of this pun uh, ultimate punishment and uh, what happened during that time. But what Paul experienced was not random. Nothing with the Lord is random. There is no randomness with God. There just isn't. It may appear random to us, but God has a plan. He sticks to his plan. Um, so what Paul was experiencing was not random. Um, but what happened in Paul's life was part of God's sovereign plan to spread the gospel. Um, I've been giving a lot of thought recently to the sovereignty of God. And it's one of those things that you don't have to like, you don't even really have to understand, but you have to respect. I understand that God's got a plan. He's got a plan for you and he's got a plan for me. Even though at this, sometimes we don't know what that plan is. Um, I trust that the wisdom of God is is active in that. Maybe it's better for me to proceed to walk places God wants me to walk without knowing what the outcome will be. So God had chosen to use plain, empty jars of clay 
to show or contain the power and the glory of God. Uh, what is important is what the vessel contains and not the vessel itself. Um, if you remember the picture of the of the oil, the alabaster box of oil that was used to to anoint Jesus' feet, um, the box uh, I, I, it may have been Josephus that said that it was you know a work of art, this beautiful box, but it's still in value. Can, it paled in comparison to the value of the oil that was in, on the inside. So there's kind of that picture of you know, it, it's useful, There's a, it's useful for what it carries, that's its purpose, is to protect and to carry what's inside. And that not that how our lives are with the gospel? In verse 12, uh, Paul, go, he kind of brings in the church at Corinth. He said, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Which means that even though Paul was threatened with death, or, and, and, and really, I think that was probably a constant, uh, was constantly something he dealt with. Um, that the church, the church at Corinth and, and, and the church at large, benefited by the gospel being presented to them and that they were being saved. It was, it was the pathway of restoration to God the Father. In verse 14, we know that he says that knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. We see that it is Paul's hope and the resurrection that kept him looking forward and moving forward and overcoming his fear of death. I would admit, I will admit, there's uh, been times in my life where I was often more concerned with what was behind me than what was in front of me. Um, we can come to regard, and it's, even it can be a kind of worship, we can regard the past uh, more so than we then we choose to live in the present or look for the future. Uh, something I've often said, uh, and I've had a few occasions lately where I had to go, you know, to, to a celebration of life or something, and, and I'm not one, and I will openly say that I, I really don't like strolling down memory lane. I wasn't always like that. I used to look back with much more fondness than I look forward and I, I come to think of like a windshield of a car. There's a reason that the windshield is so big and that the rear view mirror is so small. It's because you're not going backward. You're going forward. And you need to see the path that is in front of you. And uh, the truth of the matter is for me, I've come to understand that we're moving ultimately to the return of Christ. Um, we have that, shall we call it a blessed hope, the hope of the rapture of the church. But we also want to see souls. We want our, our church, right? The goal, we want 100 souls this year. And I think that while it's important to keep in mind what we've learned in the past, we need to go forward. I think it's, it's fine to look back and look back with fondness and, and respect and to take those lessons that you've learned and bring them forward. To, to use them as a, as a valuable springboard or a part of your education as to how to be more effective going forward. It didn't take me too many times when my dad was teaching me to mow the lawn. Uh, it didn't take me a few times, you know, getting rocks flung at the house before I learned that maybe I should, you know, take a quick look over the lawn for rocks before I start to mow. It was good advice going forward. But uh, it's... We need to, to grasp what we've learned and take things forward with a focus on spreading the gospel. In verse 15, we see that Paul, and as the other apostles, uh, they were always giving thanks to God for new converts. But he said in verse 15, For all things are for your sakes, that the grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. So it's that focus about uh, new new converts, uh, planting of churches, but they they were in spite of their appearances of being common pottery, Paul or Peter or any of the others, uh, Timothy. Uh, it, they were invincible because of the message that they carried, because of their faith, hope, love, and worship and service to God. And if I could say one more thing, oftentimes Christian reaction to adversity 
kind of like the adversity that we could be seeing in our world right now, um, has been to grin and bear it or, you know, stiff upper lip kind of uh, for our British Christian friends. Um, make it clear. Uh, Paul wanted it to be clear that it was God's power and the life of Jesus that empowered and sustained him. That's the power that sustains us. It hasn't changed from when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians. Um, the Corinthians may have looked at hardship uh, and represented by death in this passage as incompatible with the Holy Spirit-directed ministry. Um, but it did produce a life uh, that is at work or even more so energizing the apostles. Um, nobody wants to live with the threat of death. But I think there's an important lesson to be learned that the Corinthians, a lot like us today, maybe come to think that it, uh, adversity is incompatible with, uh, with spirit-filled Christian life, let alone ministering the gospel. But Paul reinforced the fact that God's power is perhaps more effectively made through adversity. And we saw it again in the in the verses, the the yet but statements where he said, he said, hard pressed yet not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, or struck down but not destroyed. How is it that ministers of the gospel live on as simple clay, clay vessels? A certain certainly not by their own strength. And I think that therein is, is the thing. It's not us. It's, it's Christ in us. There's a, a position of weakness. And in that weakness or dying or beaten or possessing nothing, that's when Jesus is revealed. And it's kind of so it's, it's a putting aside of us, our ego, who we are, so that the message of Jesus becomes bigger than the vessel, becomes more valuable than the vessel that contains it. It's a hard thing for us here in the 21st century. I, um, we, here in, in our time, we, we want to always be negotiating from a power of strength. If you've ever taken a business class, you want the upper hand. You do what you can to get the upper hand. You, you negotiate from strength. But it is those who've embraced the position of weakness that Paul sees the qualifications uh, for a true minister of the gospel. C.S. Lewis said something that I just kind of wanted to, to, to add in here. Uh, Lewis wrote, said, If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world are the ones who thought most of the next. The apostles themselves who set out on foot to convert the Roman Empire all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is because Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven, you will get the earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get neither. And that's just something to think about. Again, it's a, it's a setting aside of us, uh, of our own will, and allowing God to work through us. Um, Next time we get together, we'll finish out um, chapter four, and then probably go ahead and get into into chapter five. I just thought there was a lot. I didn't want to try to cram too much in there, but uh, in these times, I would um, I would like to just pass on a message that someone I, I respect who we lost recently. Um, he used to always tell me. He told me last time I saw him on Christmas Eve. He said to keep the faith. So I would encourage you to keep the faith and um, use this time that you have at home to, to pray. We can all become prayer warriors. We can uh, turn off the TV and we can focus on what God would have us uh, pray for. Um, I think things could happen if we um, use this time to get to our knees. Anyway, I just want to close in prayer. And I thank you so much for being with us uh, today. And I am really looking forward to when I can see you all in person. Father God, we just pray today that you would bless everyone uh, within uh, the range of my voice. And I pray, God, that you would be with us, keep us, that you would strengthen 
us and that as the church can't meet in the building that we are still the church and that we we hold each other up in prayer and, and thanksgiving and we just pray for for those who uh are are vulnerable today we just pray that you would protect them and, and that you would help us be your hands extended and we ask it in your name amen thank you